It's the cheapest smoke detector on eBay. Actually, I'm not sure if this is the cheapest smoke detector on eBay, and I have to say it's quite debatable whether you should consider buying something for about four bucks that could potentially impact the life of your entire family and your home. But that aside, I thought I'd take a look at this now because I bought it a while back, and I didn't look at it then because I'd already had a look at a smoke detector around about that same time. And although the circuitry was different, I didn't want to put out too many similar videos. So let's take a look now. And this was partially inspired by a video that Dave at EEV Blog made. And that video was inspired by a comment that Mike at Mike's Electric Stuff made regarding a microcontroller. So this is clipped together by four little clips around the edge. No screws here. And the little microcontroller in question may actually be that ubiquitous little 8-pin chip that we see in so many things. So let's uh, unclip this circuit board and whip this circuit board out here. And we'll get these bits out of the way. So this is an optical smoke detector. It's not like the ionization ones. This one actually detects a smoke by firing a beam of light and then detecting the reflection of that light inside that light-proof chamber. And if we take a closer look at this, uh, actually, you know what? You know what? I, I'm going to save some time here. I'm going to take a photo of this, and we'll take a closer look, and I'll also reverse engineer it, because this little chip here is the important bit. So just give me a moment. I'm just going to do that right now. Ah, this would have been so much easier if I hadn't screwed up quite badly and mixed the... Uh, the light emitter with the receiver up because the circuitry did not make sense immediately and I was like thinking what have I done wrong here why is this I thought here's a little cluster circuitry and that will be the receiver section I kind of assumed that I was wrong to assume that it's uh, sorted now I've sorted it out and it's really straightforward so uh, let's uh, get rid of this that I've doodled all over and cut to the the lovely glossy picture of the circuit board and we can explore it together so the unit does not use a custom smoke detector chip. That's what makes this special because the previous smoke detectors I've looked at had a dedicated chip in them and it was really, really clever. It basically, it would pulse in a chamber. Hold on, let's, let's uh, show you the chamber. That makes sense. So here's the chamber. This is the bit that's under this cover. And you've got an infrared emitter in it that fires light out that way. And you've got a receiver that, that looks for that light uh, reflecting off the smoke. And it's all ribbed. Everything is designed to stop light coming into this or to stop reflections. So if light comes from the outside, it can't shine directly. And it has to... The air can flow through the smoke, through these channels and like that. But the light can't come in. And it, it's all jet black and matte to stop reflections work, working them in. I suppose that under extremely bright conditions it could get in. The emitter here is in a little chamber which deliberately fires it in a cone that misses this completely. And this little barrier here is to stop any reflection, even though this is tapered, it's designed to stop any reflection at all coming from this port here and shining into that. So the only way this can actually see smoke is if it fills the cavity in here and it's being illuminated by the infrared beam and it's seeing the reflection in the sensor. So that's how it works. The original chips were very clever. They would pulse that infrared LED and they'd look and they'd actually analyse they wouldn't just be looking for a sort of logic change if it detected a threshold of smoke. They'd be looking at the ambient haze level so that over time, as dirt built up in the unit because dust gets in and it did start uh, causing problems, this is why you should either blow some smoke detectors out with an air duster every so often. Don't do this while they're active, uh, particularly if they're wired into a building alarm system. We'll call the fire brigade automatically. That would be most embarrassing. But you do get dedicated air duster type arrangements for blowing out the smoke detectors to get the dust out of them. The units are designed to compensate for that. They monitor how much has come back. It's not just a digital input they're getting from the receiver. Uh, they are getting a sort of analog voltage from this receiver. So as dust builds up over time, or if there's a slight haze that doesn't quite reach the threshold, it will ignore it. It also uh, does a sampling thing where if a speck of dust uh, goes in and it just drifts through and the light glints off it, if it sees that speck of dust, it will then usually sample it 
X number of times after that, it'll suddenly, it'll wake up and it'll start stamping a lot more. And if it disappears, that little speck of dust, and it doesn't get that reflection anymore, it just goes into standby mode again. If the uh, level does build up and it looks as though it's building up significantly, then it trips the alarm. And one of the interesting things is it does, every time you see that little red LED, blink on the front of your unit. That's not it, the only time it samples. Inside, it's going pulse, pulse, pulse. It's actually monitoring this all the time, quite regularly, but say it's more than once a second in this case, I think. And uh, if it sees um, that, no, what was this? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, it's doing that, but the little red LED on the case of the smoke detector only lights as part of the cycle that it will give it an extra boost and it will actually look for the sort of, it will basically sample the interior and it will also look deliberately for a reflection. It will give this a boost, look for a reflection so that it knows that this is emitting light. So it's doing a self-test on the chamber because it will get some level of reflection back. They're very complex little chips, very clever. But they're not using one in this one. No, they're using what appears to be an 8-pin microcontroller. Now, the special thing about these 8-pin microcontrollers is they're very, very cheap. The one that makes electric stuff uh, mentioned and then Dave linked to, they've all sold out rather predictably since he released that video, was from a Chinese seller and the price for these full-blown microcontrollers, you can program these microcontrollers, the price of them is three cents each. And that's not in quantities of a million or anything like that. That is in, if you buy 10 of these, it's a minimum purchase of 10, it's 30 cents for these 10 microcontrollers that you can program with your own software. The slight downside, you need the special program to program them. I couldn't find a profile for this in the Universal Programmers. Also, these are OTP, one-time programmable, which means that if you uh, are developing the software, you program the chip. If it doesn't work, you drop it in the bin, and then you get another three-cent chip and you program that. I don't know if they do an erasable one. Uh, maybe they have a development system that lets you emulate it, but it doesn't really matter because they're very, very cheap, and by the time you've ironed out the software, then the final cost of the component being bulk programmed is three cents each in small quantities, going down to about two cents in larger quantities. And suddenly it's viable to use a custom program microcontroller in a smoke detector. So let's take a look at the circuitry. The circuitry starts off. Let's uh, nudge this down here. The circuitry starts off with the supply coming in. That's the nine volt supply here. And it goes to this little regulator, a 7333A. And that's a low dropout. What that means is it will operate if there's a very little difference. So say, for instance, uh, you've got a very, the battery voltage drops to about 4 volts, it'll still be able to produce the 3.3 volts. I'm not sure what the exact spec for that is. It also has a very low standby current. Not sure what that Zener diode is for. Not sure at all. It's, uh, it's kind of pointing the wrong way around if it's what I thought it was. Uh, but... There's a capacitor there, which is this capacitor here in the schematic, and it's just a decoupling capacitor. There's also a capacitor here, but this is where it gets a bit weird because that's it up there. And I don't know why they mount, they could have mounted it across these pads, but they've got this very, very convoluted route. If I bring in the thing that I doodled on earlier on, the red dotted line indicates the 3.3 volt rail. The black line indicates the negative rail. So the, the black uh, here is taking this really complex route round the circuit board, up underneath this a little high voltage transformer for the piezoelectric sounder, and then it's going over to here. The positive is coming from the regulator, it's going up this track, it's going along here, it's jumping over through this switch contact, the, the sort of linked pins on our side of the little tactile switch, and then it's going up to that. And I don't know why they put that there. I really don't know why they did that at all. The only thing that comes to mind is that if you look at the back of the circuit board, uh, it shows, in that position, an electrolytic capacitor. And maybe it was just to give them the option of using the little uh, high-value ceramic capacitor or the electrolytic capacitor, which may have been slightly cheaper, I think. Because there's no way they could put that, the electrolytic there, because of the position of the sounder on top. Very odd, very strange. So, the capacitor is there, albeit far away. Then... The power rails go to the CPU. The CPU uh, drives the LED over, that's the little LED that's under the spring. It's always interesting how the, because the button is illuminated, it blinks. The spring that holds the button up is just jammed over the LED. 
It makes sense, I suppose. It's just wedged over the LED. It's really common. You'd think it'd put a bit of strain in the solder joints, but ultimately the uh, it's not getting pressed that often and it bottoms out on this switch first, presumably. This little tactile switch, which is the one that's jumping across a link uh, without acting as a switch there for that capacitor. The uh, LED has a 330 ohm resistor in it to limit the current through it. The switch uh, is just going from the plus 3.3 volt rail to the CPU, so it'll have an internal pull down resistor just to make it stay in a known state until that button's pressed. And then it's got the piezoelectric sounder. The piezoelectric sounder is an output from the CPU going to a transistor to turn it on. All the transistors are the same. They're J -Y -Th J3Y transistors, standard NPN transistors. So it's got a 4K7 resistor, 4,700 ohm, going to that, turns it on, and there's a little transformer. That's a little transformer here. It's a, It looks like an inductor, but it's got three pins. And it's being pulsed. The primary of that is being pulsed. This little, These two little lines in between the two coils indicate that they are in a common inductor, that they're linked together, coupled together. And that couples across to a presumably a higher voltage winding, which then drives the piezoelectric sounder with a much greater uh, movement, which results in a much higher loud volume of noise. So that's uh, the bare bones of it. That's the regulator, the processor, the basic inputs and outputs, the sort of LED, the button and the sounder. And then we get a, onto the actual sensing circuitry, which is very interesting. Would have been so much more enjoyable to doodle down if I hadn't screwed up and got them mixed up because nothing made sense. It was almost as if they'd put the wrong transistors in. But once I'd sussed out my error, it all makes absolute sense. Most of it uses the 9 volt rail. Part of it uses a 3.3 volt rail. When I say zero volts and nine volts, the zero volts just refers to the common negative rail. In this case, we've got a nine volt supply uh, for the LED is actually going through a 1K current limiting resistor and it's charging up this capacitor. The capacitor in circuit measured about 16 microfarads. I'd guess it might actually be 10 microfarads, not sure. The only way to measure that properly is to take it out of circuit. But it charges this capacitor up and then the CPU sends a drive signal via 1K resistor to the transistor and dumps that capacitor through the LED, giving a very sharp, high-intensity pulse of light. The uh, way they've done that means that if something happened, if the CPU turned on and jammed on, then there'd always be a 1K resistor to limit the current. It means that uh, you get a, get a controlled portion of current, and it's limited by this 4.7 ohm resistor in the uh, emitter of the uh, circuit, which is interesting because it means if when, if the current above that goes very high, it will sort of self-current regulate because as soon as it gets anywhere near the uh, signal from the CPU, that transistor will kind of go into a sort of resistive state of self-balance. So it's almost like a current regulator to provide a consistent uh, intensity for uh, the duration of this charge in this capacitor. It then fires across onto the photodiode. I guess it's a photodiode, which is a sort of used in a sort of rever reverse biased format. And it effectively acts like a variable resistor, a light sensitive resistor. And it forms a bridge, uh, a resistive uh, divider, with this massively high value 10 mega ohm resistor, which uh, I'm guessing is more really. It's kind of buffering this up via a transistor, but there's. Because the current's going to be quite low this transistor is never going to really turn on. It's almost acting like a variable resistor again. And this is really probably this 10 mega ohm resistor just to keep the transistor in a sort of known state. But when the light hits this, uh, which it shouldn't normally unless there's smoke, it turns on this transistor. The resistor will turn on to A value. Um, and depending on the value, the current flowing through that transistor versus this uh, 200k resistor from the 3.3 volt rail, it forms a potential divider again and the CPU will get an analog voltage going in and it is an analog input. If that chip is the one I think it is, which was the one we were talking about earlier on, then that is used as an analog input so you can actually detect not just a logic state but a varying voltage which is useful because it means it can null out. It can basically sense if there is dust in the chamber. These are the ones, the emitter is the LED, um, that's uh, this one here, the infrared LED, it's beaming the light out. And this here, oh, I've just dropped the vaping device, is the uh, receiver here. That uh, So there is a barrier between them designed to block that light from direct contact. I could demonstrate this now with that vaping device. I'll just pick the vaping device up that I've 
dropped and uh, I shall put a battery in this and I shall put my finger over the sounder. This does work. It surprisingly works down to about 3 volts, even below the point the regulator will be working. So this should be on now. If I push the test button, it makes a beeping noise and if I blow some smoke into the chamber, it does detect it. I shall disconnect the battery now, that would be quite annoying. It doesn't have a mute function. It could have had a mute function, but they didn't include that in. Battery off. Interestingly, if you blow smoke in, then you turn the power off and on again, it zeroes out on the smoke that's in there, so it won't uh, detect the residual smoke, which is, it's you know, it's designed to prevent false triggering by the build-up of dust. And that's fundamentally it. It really is that simple. It's the CPU is pulsing this uh, LED. You know, I could put an LED into this. I could. I'm going to do that right now. One moment. Okay, that's the speed it's flashing at. It's really quite fast. One, two, three, four. That is, yeah, that's, that's a really fast rate. I wasn't expecting it to be sampling so fast. So let's go back to the light again. The pulses are so short that uh, if there's any ambient light at all around that, it's not really picking up the flashing. That is still flashing, but it goes out of sync with the sort of frame rate of the camera. So uh, that, they're very brief, but then that's all that's needed, that just brief, intense pulse of light to detect the smoke. It's notable that I've disconnected the, uh, the infrared emitter in the chamber, and it's not detecting it. That's, uh, that's not detecting, you know, a slight leak through of light, so uh, it's not got that function, unless maybe it, uh, a brand new smoke detector is so clean and black inside that they wouldn't detect that anyway. Uh, I would expect maybe it would have detected that and flagged up an error, but uh, it's not. I'm sure the other one did. Uh, I also haven't been able to even turn the voltage down on the um, power supply while I was uh, testing this. I wasn't able to get it to do that sort of low battery bleep. So if you ever did get one of these, and I wouldn't recommend it because you just can't really rely on this to protect your family or your premises or yourself or anybody. Uh, I would say it's a novelty. It's useful as a backup thing for detecting, you know, where you might be keeping lithium batteries or something charging. And you want something that's just going to provide a cheap extra one you can stick up under a bench in case something did start emitting the smoke or flames. But uh, I wouldn't trust them and I would make a routine of actually pushing the test button on it just to make sure it was actually sounding. But the circuitry is very interesting. Very, very interesting indeed that they've actually used that cheap microcontroller instead of the dedicated smoke detector chip. It's made this really quite interesting.